Hello, welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of DockerCon 2021 virtual. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE. We are with Mesimu Mifair, Principal Technologist at AWS Amazon Web Services. Mesimu, thank you for coming on theCUBE, appreciate it. Um, thank you, thank you for having me. Great to see you. Love this uh, Amazon integration with Docker. I want to get into that in a second. Um, been great to see the Amazon cloud native integration working well, ECS, very popular. Every interview I've done at reInvent, uh, is every year it gets better and better, more adoption every year. Um, tell us uh, what's going on with uh, Amazon ECS because you have ECS anywhere and yeah. now that's being available. Yeah, that, that's fine. What's the uh, that's correct, uh, join. And uh, yeah, uh, so customers has been appreciating uh, the value and the simplicity of ECS for many years now. I mean, we, we launched ECS uh, back in 2014, and we have seen great adoption uh, of the product and uh, customers has always been appreciating uh, the fact that it was um, easy to operate and easy to use. Uh, this is a journey with ECS Anywhere that started a few years ago, actually. And we started this journey uh, listening to customers that had particular uh, requirements um, I like to talk about, you know, the the uh, the law of the land and the law of um, uh, of the physics, where customers wanted to go all in into uh, into the cloud, but they did have this exception that they need to uh, deal with uh, with applications that could not move to the cloud. So, as I said, this journey started uh, three years ago when we launched Outpost, um, and Outpost is our uh, manage infrastructure that uh, customers can deploy in their own data centers. And we supported ECS on day one uh, on Outpost. Um, having that said, there are lots of customers that came to us and said, we love Outpost, but there are certain applications and certain requirements uh, such as compliance or the fact simply that we have uh, like assets that we need to reuse in our data center uh, that we want to use and, and before we move into, into the cloud. So they were asking us, we love the simplicity of ECS, but we have to use gears that we have in our data center. That is when we started thinking about ECS Anywhere. So basically the idea of ECS Anywhere is that you can use ECS, the, the ECS product that you know and love, um, uh, appreciating the simplicity of using ECS, but using your uh, customer managed infrastructure as the data plane. Basically what you could do is you can define your application uh, within the ECS control plane and deploy those application on customer own um, infrastructure. What that means uh, from a very practical perspective is that you can deploy this application on your managed infrastructure ranging from uh, Raspberry Pis. This is the demo that we uh, show the reInvent when uh, we pre-announced um, ECS Anywhere, all the way up to bare metal server. Uh, we don't really care about the infrastructure underneath as long as it's supported, the OS is supported, um, we're fine with that. Okay, so let's take this to the next level. Obviously the big theme at DockerCon is developer experience. You know, that's kind of everyone's talking about that. And obviously developer yeah. productivity and innovation have to go hand in hand. You don't want to stunt the innovation equation, which is cloud native and scale, right? So yeah. how does the, the, the developer experience improve with uh, Amazon ECS and any, anywhere now that I'm on, on premises or in the cloud, can you take me through what's the improvements around uh, ECS and the developer? Yeah, um, I, I would argue that the, um, the, the, the what ECS Anywhere solves is more for operational aspect and requirements that more that are more akin to the operation team that that they need to meet. Uh, we're working very hard to um, to improve the developer experience uh, on top of ECS uh, beyond what we're doing with ECS Anywhere. So um, I'd like to step back a little bit and, and maybe tell a little bit of a story of why uh, we're working um, uh, on, on those things. So um, the customer, as I said before, uh, continue to appreciate the simplicity and the ease of use of ECS. Uh, however, what we learned um, over the years is that as we added more features uh, to ECS, we ended up uh, leveraging more EC, um, AWS services um, example uh, would be uh, 
uh, load balancer integration or secrets manager or EFS or um, other things like service discovery that uses underneath other AWS products like um, Cloud Map or Route 53. And what happened is that the end user experience, the developer experience uh, became a little bit more complicated because now customers appreciate the ease of use of these fully managed services. However, they were responsible for tying and wiring all uh, together in the application definition. So what we're working on uh, to simplify this experience is we're working on tools that kind of abstract these um, these uh, verbosity that you get with ECS. Um, uh, an example is a CloudFormation template that a, a developer would need to use uh, to deploy an application uh, leveraging all of these features uh, could, then, could end up being uh, many hundreds of CloudFormation lines um in the in the in the definition of the service so we're working on uh new tools and new capabilities to make this experience better uh some of them are cdk uh the copilot cli the aws copilot cli those are all instruments and technologies and tools that we're building to abstract that um, um uh, verbosity that i was alluding to and this is where actually also the Docker Compose integration with ECS falls in. Yeah, I was just going to ask you that, the, um, the Docker piece, because obviously it's DockerCon, um, all the developers love containers, they love what they do. Um, obviously is a native you know, not mindset of shifting left with security. How, how is the relationship with the Docker container ecosystem going with you guys? Could you take a minute to explain for the folks here watching this event and participating in the community, Explain the relationship with Docker Container specifically. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, so basically we started working with Docker many, many years ago. Um, uh, ECS was based on, uh, on Docker technology when we launched it uh, and it's still using uh, Docker technology. In last year, we started to collaborate with Docker more closely um, when Docker releases the uh, Docker Compose specification um, as an open source project. So basically Docker is trying to use the Docker Compose specification to create a, a, an infrastructure cloud agnostic uh, way to deploy uh, Docker application um, um, using those specification in multiple uh, infrastructure. As part of this journey, we work with Docker to support ECS as a backend um, for um, for this specification. Basically what this means from a very practical perspective is that you can take a Docker Compose, an existing Docker Compose file, um, and Docker says that there are 650,000 Docker Compose files uh, spread across GitHub and all um, um, uh, source control uh, system um, over the world. And basically you can take those Docker Compose file and uh, compose up and deploy transparently um, into ECS Fargate on AWS. So basically, if we go back to what I was alluding to before, the fact that a developer would need to author a many hundred line of CloudFormation template to be able to take their application and deploy it into the cloud. What they need to do now is um, authoring a new file, a YAML file, uh, with a very clear and, and um, easy to use Docker Compose syntax, compose up and deploy automatically on AWS um, and using ECS Fargate um, and many other AWS services in the backend. Uh, and what's the expectation in your mind as you guys look at the container service to anywhere model, the on-premise and, and with Outpost, um, what is the, what's the vision? Because that's again, another question mark for me is like, okay, I get it, totally makes sense. Um, but containers are showing the mainstream enterprises, not the hyperscales, you guys have always been kind of the forward thinkers, but you know, main street enterprise, I call it. They're picking up adoption of containers in a massive way. They're looking at cloud native specifically as the place for modern application development, period. That's happening. Yeah. What's the story? I mean, say it again, because I want to make sure I get this right. ECS anywhere, if I want to get on-premise and a hybrid, what's it mean for me? Uh, this goes back to what I was saying at the beginning. So there are 
there are there are what we have been discussing here are mostly two orthogonal things, right? So the fact that we enable these big enterprises to meet their requirements and meet their um, their um, checkboxes sometimes to be able to deploy outside of AWS when there is a need to do that. And this could be for edge use cases or for um, reusing gears that um, exist in the data center. So this is where ECS Anywhere is, is, is basically uh, trying, uh, this is what uh, ECS Anywhere is trying to address. There is another orthogonal discussion, which is developer experience. Uh, and that developer experience is being addressed by these additional tools. Um, what I like to say is that uh, the CloudFormation is becoming a little bit like assembler in a sense, right? It's becoming uh, very low level, super powerful, but very low level. And we want to abstract and bring the experience to the next level and make it simple for developers to leverage uh, the simplicity of some of these tools, including Docker Compose um, and, and, and being able to deploy into the cloud um, and getting all the benefits of the cloud, scalability, elasticity, and security. I love the, uh, the assembler analogy because you think about it, a lot of the innovation has been kind of like low level foundational. And if you start to see all the open source activity and the customers, the tooling does matter. And yeah. I think that's where the ease of use comes in. So the simplicity totally makes sense. Um, can you give an example of some simplicity uh, piece? Because I think, you know, you guys, you know, look at looking at ECS as the cornerstone for simplicity. I get that. Can you give an example to walk us through a, a day in the life of, of an example? Uh, an, an example of simplicity. Yeah, simplicity uh, in, in action, in, yeah. Oh, well, uh, one of the examples that I usually do, and there is this uh, notion of uh, being serverless. I, I think that there is a little bit of, a, of an obsession around serverless and trying to talk about <laughs> serverless for uh, so many things. When I talk about ECS, I like to use another moniker that is versionless. So to me, simplicity also means that I do not have to um, update my service. Right. So the way ECS works is that engineering in the service team keeps producing and keeps delivering new features for ECS overnight for customers to wake up in the morning and consuming those features without having to deal with upgrades and updates. I think that this is a very key, um, a very key example of simplicity uh, when it comes to ECS that is very hard to find. Um, in other um, solutions, whether they are on-prem or in the cloud. That's a great example. And one of the big complaints I hear just anecdotally around the industry is, you know, the speed of the minds of business want the apps to move faster and the iteration with some craft, obviously with security and making sure things is buttoned up, but things get pulled back. It's almost slowed down because the speed of the innovations happening faster than the compliance of some sort of, you know, old governance model or, code reviews, I want to approve everything. So there's a balance between making sure what's approved, whether it's security or some pipeline, um, you know, procedures and whatnot. So this is a huge I cannot, issue. I, cannot, it's I like, cannot agree more with you. Yeah, yeah it's no, true. it's absolutely true. Because I, I think that we see these uh, very interesting um, um, uh, dichotomy, I would say between startups moving super fast and enterprises try to move fast but forced to move at their um, own speed. Yeah. So when we when we deliver um, services based on, um, for example, open source software uh, that customers need to um, look after in terms of upgrade to uh, latest release, what we usually see is startup asking us, can you move faster? There is a new version of that software can you enable us to deploy that version? And then on the other hand of the spectrum, there are these big enterprises trying to move faster, but not so much, that are asking us, can you slow, can you slow down a little bit, <laughs> right? Because I cannot keep that pace. So it's a very, it's a very interesting, um, um, a very interesting time to be alive. You know, one of, the, one of the, one um... of the, things that pop up into these conversations when you talk, when I talk to VP of engineering of companies and then enterprises is that the operational uh, efficiency, you got developer productivity and you got innovation, right? You got the three kind of things going on there, knobs. 
and they all have to turn up. They, people want you know, more efficiency out of the operations, they want more developer productivity and more innovation. What's interesting is you start seeing, okay, it's not that easy, there's also a team formation. And I know Andy Jassy kind of referred to this in his keynote at reInvent last year around thinking differently around your organizational, but you know, that can be applied to technologists too. So I'd love to get your thoughts while you're here. I know you blog about this and you tweet about this, but this is kind of like, okay, if these things are all going to be knobs we turned up, innovation, efficiency, operationally, and developer productivity, what's the makeup of the team? Because you know, some are saying you got an SRE embedded, you got the platform engineering, you got versionless, you got serverless, all these things are going on, all goodness. But does that mean that the teams have to change? What's your thoughts on that? I just want to get your perspective. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that there was a joke um, going around that um, as soon as you see a job like VP of DevOps, I mean, that is not going to work, right? Because these things are, needs to be like embedded into each team, right? So there shouldn't be a DevOps team or anything. It would be just a way of working. And I totally agree with you that these knobs, they needs to go in sync, right? And you cannot just push too hard on innovation if you're not helping um, other folks um, to, uh, to be able to, you know, keep that pace um, with you. And we're trying to, uh, help customers with multiple uh, tools and services to try to um, help not only developers and making developer experience uh, better, but also helping people that are building these underneath platforms. Uh, like for example, uh, Proton, AWS Proton is, is a good example of these where uh, we're focusing on helping these um, teams that are trying to build platforms that are not looking themselves as being agile or very fast, uh, but they're 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 measured on being secure, being compliant, and being you know within a guardrail uh, that an enterprise, um, a regulated enterprise needs to have. So we need to help all of these people, um, both organizationally as well as with providing tools and technologies that help them in their specific areas um, to succeed. Yeah, and I, what's interesting about all this is that, you know, I think we're also having conversations and, and again, you're starting to see things more clearly here at DockerCon, we saw some things at KubeCon, which the joke there was, not joke, but the observation was, it's less about Kubernetes, which is now becoming boringly reliable, to more about cloud native applications under the covers with programmability. So as all this is going on, there truly is a flip of a script. You can actually re-engineer and refactor everything, not just re-platform your applications and IT at once right now, there's a window. Whether it's security or whatever, now that the containers and the, and the Docker ecosystem and the container ecosystem and the, the Kubernetes, you've got EK, AKS and you've got ECS, Fargate, I mean, all this stuff's a goodness. Companies can yeah. actually do this right now. They can actually change everything. This is a yeah. unique time and this window might close or certainly change. And if you're not on it now, it's the same argument of the folks who got caught in the pandemic and weren't in the cloud got flat footed. So, you know, you're seeing that example of if you weren't in the cloud during the pandemic, before the pandemic, you were probably losing during the pandemic. The ones that won yeah. were the already guys that were in the cloud. Now the same thing's true with cloud native. If you're not getting into it now, you're probably going to be in the wrong side of history. What's your reaction to that? Yeah, no, I, 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 I agree uh, totally. I, I, I like to uh, think about this. I usually uh, talk about this if I can stay back, step back a little bit. And I think that in this industry, and I have gray areas and I have seen lots of things. Um, I think that there has been two big democratization events in IT that happened and occurred in the last 30 years. So the first one was from, you know, from uh, when um, the uh, PC technology has been introduced, distributed computing uh, from the mainframe area. And that was the first democratization uh, step, right? So everyone had access to um, uh, computers so they could do things. If you, if you fast forward to these days, um, uh, what happened is that on top of that computer, whatever that became a server or whatever, there is a, a very complex stack of technologies uh, that allow you um, to deploy and, and develop and deploy your application, right? But that stack of technology and the complexity of that stack of technology is daunting in, in some way, right? So it is inhibit, 
access and, and democratic access to technology. So to me, this is what cloud enabled, right? So the next step of democratization was the introduction of cloud services that allow you to bypass that stack, which we call undifferentiated heavy lifting because you know um, you don't get paid for managing, I don't know, an EMR server or whatever. Uh, you get paid for extracting value through application logic from that big stack. So uh, I totally agree with you that we're in a unique position to enable everyone um, with what we're building uh, to innovate a lot faster and in a more secure way. Yeah, and what, what comes out, I totally agree. And I think that's a great historical view. And I think let's bring this down to the present today and then bring, bring this as, a, as the bridge to the future. If you're a developer, you could, and by, by the way, no matter whether you're programming infrastructure or just writing software, or even just calling APIs and rolling your own, composing your services, it's programmable. And it's just all accessible. So I think that that's going to change the, again, back to the three knobs, developer productivity, or just people productivity, operational efficiency, which is scale, and then innovation, which is the business logic where I think machine learning starts to come in, right? So if you can get the container thing going, you start yeah. tapping into that control plane. So it's not so much just the data control plane, it's like a software control plane. Yeah, no, absolutely. The fact that you can, I mean, as I said, I have gray hair, so I've seen <laughs> a lot of things. And back in the days, I mean, the, the I mean, the, the, the whole notion of being able to call an API and get 10 servers, for example, or today 10 containers, yeah. it, it, it would be like, you know, uh, almost a joke, right? So we spent a lot of time racking and, and, um, and doing so much manual stuff that was so error prone. Because yeah. we usually talk about uh, velocity and agility, but we, we rarely talk about, you know, the, the uh, the difficulties and the, 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 the problems that doing things manually introduce in a process, uh, yeah, the know, way that you can get wrong. Masma, you know, you know, it reminds me of uh, this industry and I always like, found like, get off my lawn. In the old days I walked to school with no shoes on in the snow. We had to build our own kernel and our own graphics libraries. And then, you know, now they have all these tools. It's like, you're just an old, you know, coder. But, but, the, but joking aside, you know, that experience, you're bringing up a point and for the younger generation who have never loaded a Linux operating system before or have done anything at that level. It's not so much old versus young, it's more of a systems thinking. You said distributed computing. If you look at all the action, it's essentially distributed computing with new software paradigm. And, and it's a system architecture. It's not so much software to engineering, software developer, you know, this, that, it's just basically all engineering at this point, it's all software. It, it is, it is very much indeed. It's, uh, it, it, it's all software. There is no other, um, there is no other way to call it. it it's, um, I mean, we go back to talk about, you know, infrastructure as code and everything is now uh, code or software in, in, in a way. It, it's, um, yeah. That's been great to have you on. Congratulations, ACS Anywhere. Uh, being available, it's great stuff um, and great to see you and, and great to have this conversation. Um, Amazon Web Services, obviously uh, the world has, has gone super cloud. Uh, now you have distributed computing with Edge, IOT exploding beautifully, which means a lot of new opportunities. So thanks for coming on. Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure. Okay, Thank you. CUBE coverage of DockerCon 2021 virtual. This is theCUBE, I'm John Furrier, your host. Thanks for watching.